Good morning. Today's lecture is entitled The Prince and the Palace, Human Made Divine on the Palatine Hill. And I want to begin essentially where we left off, and that is with the Emperor Vespasian, the founder of the Flavian dynasty. And the political shrewdness that Vespasian demonstrated when he made the decisions uh, that he did, when he made the decision especially to use architecture <coughs> to further his political agenda. And you'll recall that the way in which he did that was that he, and I'm just going to show you the site plan once again uh, on the Esquiline and Palatine Hills, the site plan that shows us how he did this. How he did this was he recognized that he didn't want to associate himself with Nero. But it was to his advantage to, so to associate himself instead with the Emperor Claudius. And he did that by finishing uh, the platform and indeed the temple itself that we looked at at that time, what we looked at uh, last time, and that is the temple of the divine Claudius, the Claudianum, that had been begun by Agrippina the Younger. He completed that as a nod to Claudius. And again, a very smart political move on his part. He also, as you'll recall, raised the Domus Aurea of Nero to the ground, covered up what was left of it otherwise, and then he filled in the artificial lake. Uh, and he used the property that the artificial lake was on to build the Colosseum, uh, which itself was a shrewd gift to the Roman people to gain their favor. Uh, and he did succeed in that regard. Equally important, perhaps even more important, is the decision that Vespasian made in the year 79 A.D. And that decision, and we see a portrait once again of Vespasian on the right-hand side of the screen, <coughs> now in Copenhagen. The decision he made in 79 was to appoint his elder son, Titus, as co-regent. And we see a portrait of Titus on the left-hand side of the screen in military costume. Uh, we see him, it's a portrait that was found in Herculaneum, uh, so that we know it needs to date prior to 79. Uh, so very likely sometime in the 70s that particular statue was put up. Now the reason it was smart politically <coughs> to appoint Titus as his co-regent was that Titus was extremely capable. He was also extremely popular in Rome with the people, with the Senate. And uh, it, what it did was to ensure the succession, to ensure the succession. And so when Vespasian died of natural causes in 79 AD, <coughs> Titus was prepared to take over. And indeed, indeed he did, and he took over without any contest whatsoever, which was a, was a great accomplishment. Titus, however, uh, oh, and Titus, by the way, was young when he became emperor. He was in his early 30s, about 32 full of energy, uh, and he needed it for what lay ahead, because he was unlucky. Uh, and his, his, uh, his reign was affected by three major events, uh, the first of which you know intimately already, and that is the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. Titus's reign was 79 to 81. So in 79 AD, <coughs> uh, AD uh, Vesuvius erupts, and Titus has to deal with the consequences of that, covered over, as you well know, almost all of Campania. In the year 80, uh, he <laughs> suffered, or Rome suffered, a very serious plague, which Titus also had to deal with. He had to marshal all of his energy and all his ingenuity uh, to deal with a very serious plague in Ro a very serious plague in Rome. And that plague was, was followed by a fire, also an exceedingly serious fire. Uh, so Titus had his hands full, and perhaps it's not surprising, given all the stress of those years, that he too died of natural causes in 81 at a very young <coughs> age. But despite what he went through during 79 to 81, uh, Titus, Titus's claim to fame was something that happened much earlier, and I've mentioned it before. And that is something that happened already in the year A.D. 70. And it was in the year A.D. 70 that Vespasian sent his elder son to Jerusalem, to Judea, uh, to get involved in a major military war. Uh, and it, it was Titus, as you'll recall, who was victorious in the Jewish wars. 
uh, and that took place in 70 A.D. 70 A.D. and it was extremely important not only in itself from Rome's standpoint uh, but also because it provided legitimacy to the Flavian dynasty. I mentioned that the uh, w that when a Roman dynasty came to power in a civil war, which was the case both for Augustus after the civil war forty, uh, the civil war that was that Rome was plunged mm -hmm. into after Caesar's death, uh, and was a case again for Vespasian after the chaos of the year sixty eight sixty nine. They needed a foreign victory to gain legitimacy, so for the Flavian dynasty, the war uh, over Jerusalem was gave them that legitimacy and was therefore extremely important in terms of the art and ideology of the Flavian dynasty. I want to turn to an arch that was put up in honor of that very victory <coughs> over Jerusalem uh, sometime after A.D. 81. It was the so-called Arch of Titus, the most, one of the most famous Roman monuments of all. Uh, and it was put up, although it bears Titus' name, it was put up not by him, but by his brother Domitian, his younger brother Domitian, who succeeded him after Titus' death, which is why we date it to sometime <coughs> after A.D. 81. I want to show you first its location, because that itself is significant. We are looking at the Google Earth view of the Roman Forum. You see the Roman Forum here. You see the Colosseum up at the top center. Uh, you see the ca Capitoline Hill or Campidoglio here, the Victor Emmanuel Monument here. I pointed these out many times before. The uh, Via de Fori Imperiali of Mussolini, the Imperial Fora <coughs> to the left. Uh, again, the Roman Forum here. And the Palatine Hill, which we're going to be concentrating <coughs> on today. But you'll remember that Nero's hope was to link the Palatine Hill with the Esquiline Hill, which is wide, right up to the left of the Colosseum, and to do that via a spur hill, a spur hill that's located just right here, a bit above my finger, uh, a spur hill called the Velia, V-E-L-I-A, uh, that was to link the two. And you'll remember Nero's plans for his Domus Transitoria, this palace that was to serve as a point of transit between those two hills. And you'll recall also uh, the remains of some of the rooms from the Domus Transitoria. So this was, again, land that had, been, uh, that had been built up by Nero. So it's not surprising to see the Flavians, once again, uh, Titus following suit and then his younger brother Domitian following suit, to use land that had earlier been used by Nero for new Flavian monuments. In this case, an arch put up to the victory that Titus celebrated over Jerusalem. And if you look very carefully, again, just a bit, a few inches above where my finger is, you will see uh, the Arch of Titus uh, standing <coughs> on that spur hill on the Velia between the Palatine and the Esquiline Hills. The Arch of Titus, again, which dates to after A.D. 81, was placed right next to the Sacred Way or the Via Sacra. It doesn't span the street, but it's placed right next to it, adjacent to it. And I think you can see that very well in these two views here, which also show that a quite a bit of ancient road actually survives, or a piece of ancient ro road actually survives in the Roman Forum. It's on the slope that you see here. Uh, and you can see the way in which it goes right by uh, the Arch of Titus that you see to its right. This is a view up uh, the hill, up the Sacred Way toward the Velia and here down uh, from the Arch of Titus down uh, into the rest of the Forum. And again, you can see the polygonal masonry of the ancient road still preserved. The ancient way, the, the Via Sacra, was the road that the triumphant general took when he returned to Rome after a great military victory. So this is exactly the road that Titus himself would have taken when he came back from, from Judea uh, and, and walked in triumph or rode in triumph in his chariot along the Sacred Way and up to the Capitoline Hill because the triumphant general uh, who was, who was uh, garbed in, with the attributes of Jupiter in this procession made his way up to the Capitoline Hill, would, would get off his chariot up there right at the altar in front of the temple of Jupiter OMC 
and make a sacrifice to Jupiter. So you have to imagine uh, Titus doing this along with Vespasian, because you'll remember I mentioned to you that they celebrated a joint triumph, that Titus was willing to share his triumph uh, with his father Vespasian. Uh, so they both would have come in, in triumph uh, into Rome after this great victory. Once again, you can see the arch in the view on the right. Another view of the arch here, which shows it on the Velia, and here you can get a very good sense of the way in which that spur hill unites the Palatine and the Esquiline, as well as the proximity of the Arch of Titus to the Colosseum. We are seeing that the Flavians are building up a certain area of Rome uh, with their monuments, and this is no exception. The view that we see here from the forum of, the, of one side of the Arch of Titus shows a modern inscription, but we'll see that there is an ancient inscription on the other side. And we're also going to see uh, that although the arch looks very well preserved, it was actually quite heavily restored uh, by an architect by the name of uh, Giuseppe Valladier. Uh, and that happened in the 19th century, that Valladier, V-A-L-A-D-I-E-R, Giuseppe Valladier, restored uh, the Arch of Titus. And the part of the, the arch <laughs> that is ancient is essentially the central section right here, the, the, uh, mostly on the other side, actually. On this side, just the spandrels and the inner panels here. Uh, and on the other side, we'll see, well, I'll show you when we get to the other side. So this side, important to know that the inscription is a modern one. Here's the other side of the arch where you can see, again, the central section <coughs> is ancient with the spandrels, these uh, triangular areas here. Uh, the columns on this side are ancient. The keystone is ancient. The frieze up above uh, the keystone is ancient. The inscription is ancient on this side. But all the rest was restored by Valadier, uh, as I said, in the 19th century. And Valadier did something very interesting and, and archaeologically very, uh, very uh, forward-thinking in that since the center of the arch was made out of Greek marble, pentelic marble, P-E-N, T-E-L-I-C, Pentelic Marble from Mount Pentelicon in Greece, which in itself is interesting because we saw that the Flavians were using imported marbles in their buildings. I've mentioned that already before. So we, we see a <laughs> continuation of that trend here, use of Pentelic Marble for the arch. Uh, but when Valadier did the <laughs> restorations, he or the reconstruction, he used travertine for the modern parts of the arch, so that when you, probably isn't so evident to you from this view, but when you stand in front of the arch, you can see the difference in the materials, and he wanted to point out to the spectator that there was a difference between the ancient part of the monument and the modern part of the monument as restored by him. This view on the left, there are quite a number of uh, preserved paintings and engravings uh, that show the arch before the Valadier <coughs> reconstruction, and you see one of those over there, and you can see we're looking at the same side of the arch here as we are here. So once again, you can see the ancient, uh, what survived of the ancient arch, the central part, the two columns on bases, uh, the uh, keystone, the, the spandrels, the uh, frieze, and then the and then the inscription. What does that say? Great. Okay, fine, we'll accept that. Uh, so, and we see that here, and this is w another one of those Roman monuments that was essentially preserved because of reuse over time, or at least the part of it that, that still I exists. Uh, and this was turned into, as so many other monuments, was turned into a <coughs> fortress at one point, a fortress that was owned by the Frangipani family in Italy. So that's the ancient part, the rest restored by Valadier. And you have to also reconstruct in your mind's eye uh, that this arch would have served as a kind of statue base for a representation or for a sculptural group uh, in bronze that would have represented Titus and perhaps Vespasian also together seated in a chariot being led by four horses, uh, a, a great quadriga group that was customarily placed on the top of such arches. Below that, the inscription plaque. Below that, as I've already described, a frieze. I'm going to show you that frieze in a moment. Uh, then the spandrels. And then in the center here, two great panels, one on either figural panels, one on either side of the arch. You see the inscription here. It's interesting because it tells us that it was the Senate and people of Rome, the SPQR, the Senate and people of Rome, who put this up to uh, the divine Titus, 
Diwo Tito, as you can see here, and uh, the divine Titus, who was the son, there's an F for Phileas right over here, uh, the son of the divine Vespasian. So the divinity of both of these men, both of whom were made gods at their death, is alluded to here. So the Senate and people of Rome put this up to the divine <coughs> Titus, the son of the divine Vespasian. And if, and if you, you can see all of these little holes uh, that are located in some of the letters. Uh, the reason for tho those is that those were where bronze letters were actually attached. Uh, so these letters were inscribed, and then bronze letters were attached to them uh, so that the inscription would gleam in the sunshine and so that you could see it from considerable distance. Down below the inscription plaque, we see the frieze, uh, which purports to represent <coughs> this great procession or parade that took place when, when Titus returned from Jerusalem uh, and had his triumphal procession along the Sacred Way and, and up to the Capitoline Hill in the Temple of Jupiter. Uh, and you can see that the artist has, uh, has made the figures <coughs> fairly small, but at the same time has, has made each one distinct from the other so that this is more readable from the ground. And then below that, decoration of the keystone, and then in either a spandrel or triangular area at either side of the keystones, we see victories, flying, vic flying female figures of victory that are, of course, making reference in a general way uh, to this great victory that, that, that Titus had over Jerusalem. Important from the architectural standpoint are the columns and especially the capitals. I show you a detail of one of the preserved, there are two again, but one of the two preserved capitals from this side of the arch, the arch that, the side that faces the Colosseum, uh, and you see it here, and it's a distinctive capital that we have not seen before. Uh, it's a capital that actually combines the Corinthian and the Ionic, because you can see the Corinthian acanthus leaves growing up here, uh, flowers as we see in the, in the usual Corinthian order, and then uh, prominent volutes of the Ionic order up above. We refer to this as the composite capital, the composite capital combining Corinthian and Ionic. We see it quite infrequently in Roman architecture, but we do see it on occasion, uh, so it's good for you to know about. In the center of the bay, I mentioned that there were two great <coughs> figural panels, and these figural panels make reference to, uh, to Titus's victory over Jerusalem, to this important event from the point of view of the Flavians that gave their dynasty legitimacy. And we see one of those here. Uh, we actually see an image of Titus in his chariot, and he's riding alone without his father. Uh, he's riding alone in his chariot, uh, with the exception of a female figure who accompanies him. Uh, and you can see that female figure is winged, and she is a personification of victory. So she is heralding uh, the victory that he has had in Jerusalem. And in fact, she holds a laurel wreath above his head, crowning him because of that victory. The chariot is led by four horses who are whizzing by, as you can see here. Uh, and they are led at the front by a woman in a helmet and military costume who might well be Roma, the personification of Rome herself. And what is she doing? She's welcoming Titus back to Rome after his great victory over Jerusalem. Over here, two other figures, a, two other male figures, both headless today, but one of them uh, in a toga and the other figure with a bare chest and a mantle wrapped over the lower part of his body. Uh, because we have the s same figures in other reliefs, we know, despite the fact that they are headless, that these are personifications of the Senate. The, the dressed person, the person in toga is the Senate, the genius, G-E-N-I-U-S, like genius, the genius senatus, or the spirit of the Senate. Uh, and this, the genius populi romani, which was the, the uh, representative of the Roman people. So keep in mind, again, it was the Senate and people of Rome that put up uh, the arch to uh, Titus, and, uh, the son of the divine Vespasian, and we see themselves, rep or their personifications, represented in this scene. More interesting <coughs> from our standpoint vis-a-vis -vis architecture is the other scene on the other side of the central bay, uh, where we see the Roman soldiers, or a group of Roman soldiers, bringing back spoils, or booty, trophies, uh, from uh, Jerusalem, things that they have stolen from the temple in Jerusalem. And you can see the famous seven-branched candelabrum 
uh, that they are carrying here. The weight is so great that it is that their, their uh, shoulders bend under that weight. Uh, and we also see them with a table over here that has a number of sacrificial implements and so on that were taken also from the temple in Jerusalem. So they carry these along in this parade for the people to see, for uh, those in Rome to see, uh, to get a, a real a palpable sense of what it meant to have this victory and of the spoils that are being brought back. And you can see that they, this is represented very illusionistically, and you can see that they seem to uh, be a walking through uh, an arch that is also represented here, a very interesting uh, scene indeed. And you'll recall uh, what, what they did with those spoils. They took those spoils and they put them in the uh, Templum Pacus that we talked about last time, or the Forum Pacus that we talked about last time, that served essentially as a kind of museum uh, where the people of Rome could see uh, these <coughs> images. So once again, the Flavians always showing an affinity for and an interest in uh, the people of the city, the people of the city uh, that they were trying, of course, to court favor from. So we're seeing Domitian, uh, who again was the commissioner of this monument, <coughs> continuing on in the same vein as Vespasian and Titus, honoring this victory uh, that gave legitimacy to uh, the Flavian dynasty, but also always acknowledging and thinking of the impact that it's going to have on the Senate and the people of Rome. The central bay, if you stand right below it uh, and look up, you will see the vault of the interior of the arch. Uh, and you can see that it has uh, a coffered ceiling, as we've seen so often in Roman monuments, quite well preserved with the coffers and then the rosettes uh, in the center. And if I show you another detail of that, you'll get an even better sense of it and also of how ornate the decoration is. We've <coughs> talked about the fact that the Flavians had a particular interest in very ornate decoration. And you can see that as well here. In fact, the drill has been so used so extensively that it almost dematerializes uh, the vault, I think, in a very interesting way, uh, creating a kind of overall tapestry of dark and light. Uh, and then in the center, a panel that is surrounded by a garland. Uh, and in the center of that panel, a depiction, you can probably barely see it from where you sit, but a depiction of Titus being carried to heaven on the back of an eagle. In this case, Titus is not in military dress, but in a toga. He's on the back of an eagle with outstretched wings, and that eagle is taking him up to the heavens. What this is is a representation of apotheosis, A-P-O-T-H-E-O-S-I-S, -S, apotheosis, or divinization. The divinization, because the Romans believed that they could make humans into gods after their death, <laughs> Uh, the making of Titus into a god after his death and the depiction of the material depiction of him actually being carried to heaven <laughs> on the back of an eagle, a very powerful image. And the fact that it is in the Arca vault uh, of, this, uh, of this vault here has led scholars to suggest that it is possible that the Arch of Titus in Rome served as Titus's tomb. And that seems to be corroborated by the fact that behind the attic, or inside the attic of the arch, is a staircase as well as a chamber. And I show both of them to you here, a spiral staircase and a chamber, a chamber that might well have served as a burial chamber uh, for an urn uh, uh, of Titus. The urn was, never found, was not found in the excavation of this monument, so we can't prove this, but I think it's very possible uh, that this arch served as a tomb uh, for the emperor Titus. Titus, uh, after, uh, Titus was succeeded, as I've already mentioned, by his younger brother <coughs> Domitian, uh, whom you see in two portraits here, a portrait from Munich on the left in military garb, uh, and then a bust-length portrait in Rome on the right-hand <coughs> side of the screen. Uh, Domitian was born in AD 51, so he was only your age, about 19, uh, when uh, Titus went off to the Jewish wars. Uh, there was never any question that Domitian would succeed his brother. Vespasian was in this for the long haul. He, he created a dynasty and expected both of his sons, first Titus, his older son, and then his younger son, Domitian, to succeed him. So Domitian's eventual rise to power was never in question. Uh, and yet Domitian was jealous of his brother, who was very popular in Rome, as I've already mentioned, and who had this great military victory on which the 
uh, Flavians uh, based their claim to rule, and Domitian was, was very jealous of his brother. He felt out of the loop. Uh, and so when he succeeded uh, uh, Titus quicker than he thought, because Titus died way <coughs> before his time, in his 30s, as you know, when Domitian succeeded Titus, he came to power as a very embittered <coughs> man. And he never got over that bitterness. And in fact, what we see Domitian doing is really reverting to the megalomaniacal uh, way of thinking of people like Caligula and Nero. Uh, exercising his imperial prerogatives to the fullest, and uh, in fact, even insisting that he be uh, that he be ad addressed as Lord and God, Dominus et Deus, which I've put on your monument list for you, Dominus et Deus, at Lord and God, uh, and he, not surprisingly, given his bent, he not surprisingly moved away from the public architecture that Vespasian and Titus had favored. For Vespasian, of course, buildings like the Colosseum. For Titus, the Baths of Titus, uh, the public architecture that had been favored by his father and his brother. He moved back to being interested in building palatial architecture, essentially, uh, to his own glory. And we're going to see that the major monument that he commissioned was the imperial palace on the Palatine Hill that had been begun by, uh, by Tiberius and Caligula. He completed that palace in the 90s AD. Before we get to that, which will be our main focus today, I would like, because it's extensive and there's a lot to see, I would like to um, say a, a few words about another commission of Domitian, because he wasn't without uh, the desire to at least build some public buildings, and I'd like to begin with one of those here. This is a model of the so-called stadium of Domitian, a stadium or race course uh, that was used, uh, that was put up during Domitian's reign. We date it usually to the latter part of his reign, 92 to 96 AD. And you see that model again here. And you can tell a lot about this building uh, from <coughs> both the scanty remains, uh, but also <coughs> Uh, from uh, other, other evidence that allows us to be able to reconstruct it relatively accurately. Uh, you see it here. These uh, stadia t uh, were hairpin in shape, as you can see, a straight end on one side, a curved end on the other, but long, elongated, a kind of elongated oval with one uh, straight side, uh, as you can see. It was put up in very similar fashion to theaters and to amphitheaters in that they built a concrete uh, a hill and line that concrete hill with stone seats uh, and then buttress it with a wall, as you can see here, uh, that was decorated just like the Theater of Marcellus or like the Colosseum, with in this case two tiers of arches, two, uh, two sets of arcades uh, with columns in between them, those columns again having no structural purpose whatsoever, just used as decoration uh, for the monument, and then the exits and entrances again done very similarly to amphitheater or theater architecture as we've discussed it thus far. So the main difference is it's not quite as tall as amphitheaters, for example, or theaters, and just two tiers of columns, as you can see here. Uh, and the main, dif the main difference in plan is that it's a hairpin shape, again, with one uh, straight side and one <coughs> curved side. Only a small, uh, one can see today, and this is essentially underground, or what survives of it is underground, although there's one section that can be still be seen, as I'll show you in a moment. But what's absolutely miraculous is the, fa is the fact that the actual hairpin shape of the Stadium of Domitian is preserved in its entirety in the shape of one of Rome's most famous piazzas, and my favorite by far, uh, the Piazza Navona, which you see from the air here in a Google Earth image. And you can see again the exact shape, the straight side uh, and the curved side of uh, Domitian's stadium, still preserved in the um, Piazza Navona in Rome. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful <coughs> piazza for those of you who've been there. I'm sure you, 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 you <coughs> have enjoyed uh, your spending time there. For those of you who haven't, it really is a mecca uh, within Rome. And you can see not, on, not only is it a pleasant place to walk, uh, yeah. but also a place to see great buildings. For example, uh, Francesco Borromini's uh, San Agnese in Agone and Bernini's uh, Four Rivers, famous Four Rivers Fountain in the center of the piazza in dialogue with one another. And as we look at this from the air and we look at the, at the curved end of the 
Piazza Navona, you can see there's one street uh, that you can take out of that curved end, one small street. If you take a left, uh, and then a left again, you will see the remains of the Stadium of Domitian. I'm going to show those to you in a moment. And if you stay in the center of the piazza near the Four Rivers Fountain and you go uh, sort of diagonally across from that, you will end up at one of the four best uh, ice cream places in Rome. Get this, you can get some of the best gelato in Rome. You can get good gelato almost anywhere in Rome and in Italy, but the very best, uh, this is one of those four. Say something more about that in a moment. Here are the remains of the uh, of the Stadium of Domitian that can still be seen. Very few tourists uh, notice this, but it's well worth looking at because you can see the brick faced cement construction that served uh, for the that was how the substructures of this building were built. And I think you can even see that from a distance here, uh, made out of concrete, faced with brick. But the arcades and the columns that I showed you before, out of travertine, ashlar masonry travertine, which was one of the last buildings actually in Rome to be made of uh, travertine ashlar masonry. Uh, just to, just to, to show you also that, again, just as we d when we were in Capri, I showed you the bar Tiberio and its reference to Tiberius. It's amazing what those who put up restaurants and bars and so on uh, around Rome, it, it's amazing. It, it, it demonstrates the, the strong sense of history that Italians have because uh, just the fact that they recognize that uh, these are remains from the Stadium of Domitian. <coughs> Everyone thinks of this structure as the Piazza Navona, but the fact that they are well aware of the fact that it was Domitian's stadium so that the wine bar across the street, and this is one that was just opened the last couple of years, the wine bar across the street uh, is called the Domiziano, the Domiziano after uh, Domitian because it's right across the street from the Stadium of Domitian. With regard to ice cream, uh, you, I take my gelato seriously, and I'm sure all of you who've been to Italy <laughs> feel the same way. It's, like, it's not like American ice cream. Not that American ice cream isn't good, uh, but it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I, so I will make some recommendations uh, this semester. And this is the first one that I'm going to make because it's one of my favorites. And everyone agrees this is one of the best ice cream parlors in Rome. It's called Tre Scalini. It's also a restaurant. A uh, restaurant you can pass on, uh, like so many restaurants in the center of famous piazzas. It's not the best. But uh, yeah, and you don't have to sit outside, although they will try to beckon you to sit outside because it costs more to eat the ice cream outside than it does if you just walk into or walk through the door. There are actually two doors, one on that side, one on this side. Uh, go right up to the counter, take a look at what's there, uh, and make your order. And I, the, the, my recommendation <laughs> for this particular gelateria uh, is the tartufi. They are very famous. These, this is the best tartufo in Rome, without question, if you like chocolate. Uh, it's, a, it's a chocolate bomb, essentially, as you can see in these images here. It is one big, uh, well, fairly large, uh, very rich uh, chocolate with big, <laughs> big, the biggest chocolate chips you ever saw on it. And then they, they put a dollop. I don't even like whipped cream, but when it's panna, when it's panna on top of the tartufo, I go the whole way. So you, you have uh, you, the pond on top of the tartufo. And if, if you sit outside and are willing to pay extra, they'll throw a pirouette on the top. If not, you have to forego the pirouette. But I really highly recommend, whether you like chocolate or you don't like chocolate, I've gone with people who are not the kind of chocolate I am, uh, who, who, um, who like this anyway. So it's really some, a treat. And at least once when you're in Rome, you have to <coughs> indulge in a tartufo at Tre Scalini. I want to move from Domitian's uh, stadium to the building that we're going to concentrate on today, because again, it is so extensive. And that is Domitian's Palace on the Palatine Hill. We usually refer to it as Domitian's Palace on the Palatine Hill or the Imperial Palace on the Palatine Hill. Uh, but the nomenclature is, is, is complex because it, in antiquity it was referred to as the Domus, the Domus Augustana, like the Domus Aurea. <laughs> Golden House of Nero, the Domus Augustana, Augustus's house, essentially, <laughs> uh, because by this point, uh, the word Augustus had become synonymous with emperor. So every emperor was the Augustus. Uh, so this is the Domus Augustana, uh, which again continues construction. We talked about the fact that Tiberius had begun a palace <coughs> on the Palatine Hill, on the slope of the Palatine Hill, that Caligula had added to that. 
His successors, uh, Claudius, uh, was not that interested in palatial architecture, as you'll remember. Uh, Nero had other <laughs> plans uh, for the Domus Transitoria and for the Domus Aurea. Uh, so it was left to the Flavians, specifically to Domitian, to complete the imperial palace, uh, which he does. Uh, and then it is dedicated, as you can see from the monument list, in AD 92. We also know the architect of the Domus uh, Augustana, and that was a man by the name of Rabirius, R-A-B-I-R-I-U-S, very important Roman architect by the name of Rabirius. To get back to the nomenclature for a moment, so the actual name of the palace was the Domus Augustana, but here's where it gets uh, complicated. There's also a public wing of the house and a private wing of the house. The public wing, and you can see it in this Google Earth image from the air, the public wing is on one story, uh, and we see that over here, and that was referred to in ancient times as the Flavian House, the Domus Flavia, the Domus Flavia. The private wing was on two stories, or part of it was on two stories. You can see it here, it's even larger, more extensive. Uh, and that was called in ancient times also the Domus Augustana. So the w this word, the Domus Augustana, referred both to the private wing, as opposed to the Domus Flavia, but also to the palace as a whole. So I just wanted you to be aware of that, because as you do your reading and the textbooks and so on, uh, you might find that <coughs> a little bit confusing. But we can, make, we can simplify it completely and just call it the Palace of Domitian uh, on the Palatine Hill, which is what I suggest we do. So once again, we can see quite good in this view from the air uh, the way in which this, uh, this uh, Domitianic structure was planned and built. Uh, we see over here, for example, and I'm going to show you these in plan and also the remains shortly. Uh, we can see on the upper left uh, what is a basilica, next to that a, an audience hall, a great fountain court over here, a triclinium or dining room. Uh, over here, and then fountains on either side that belong to the Domus Flavia, or the public room, of public uh, area of the palace, public section of the palace, and then over here the private area, as I said, larger on two stories right here, with a court in the center, <coughs> and a whole host of small rooms surrounding that, living quarters and so on for Domitian and others, uh, a peristyle court, another peristyle court, and then a great sunken stadium uh, over here on the right. This was a far cry from Romulus's huts, uh, as you see them, the Romulus's village uh, of the 8th century BC that I remind you of over here, uh, and show you uh, what, what has happened in the, inter, inter, uh, in the in interlude. But what's extremely important, I think, given a Domitian's view of himself as Lord and God, as Dominus et Deus, uh, it's interesting to see what he built. I mean, he certainly felt that he was very much in the tradition of Romulus. He wants to associate himself with Romulus, and also, of course, with Augustus, who lived, uh, as you know, on the Palatine Hill. But at the same time, he wants to inject uh, his living space with the kind of grandeur uh, that had not been, that was certainly true under Nero and his Domus Aurea, but that had not been true for any of the other earlier <coughs> Roman emperors. So the Domus Aurea, the impact of the Domus Aurea, once again, is something we should think about as we look at this incredible palace. This is a, a, a plan from the Ward Perkins textbook that perhaps shows you better than the view from the air exactly what this, uh, this structure was all about. We see the, uh, the, uh, the public wing on the left-hand side, the Domus Flavia of the palace on the Palatine Hill, and it includes, as you can see in the upper left corner, a basilica, a basilica, a room with a central, central space divided by two side aisles by columns. Uh, and that was a basilica that, that uh, the Domitian himself sat in and tried cases in as the judge. Then next to that, an audience hall, or an aula, A-U-L-A, -A, uh, that was the place where Domitian met with visiting dignitaries. Uh, then on axis, with the, uh, then, uh, up in the upper right, a lorarium, which was a place where they kept household gods and so on. Then uh, on axis with the audience hall, the peristyle. The peristyle, and if, you, and if you look at that in plan, it's got columns, of course, as peristyles do. But look at what's in the center of it. It actually is a fountain, and it is the fountain that is octagonal in shape. So the impact of Nero's Domus Aurea, immediately clear 
the impact of that remarkable octagonal room on the architecture of Domitian and on the architect Riberius, so a, an octagonal <laughs> fountain. And then on axis with the aula or audience hall, the peristyle, is the triclinium or dining room of the house, a very large dining room with panoramic windows through which one could see a very interestingly elliptically shaped fountain, one on either side. Now, as you look at that plan of the Domus uh, Flavia, and especially at the Basilica, the audience hall, and the triclinium, there is one feature that all three of those have in common that I haven't yet mentioned, uh, which is what? All three of them have what? No one? A half circle, okay, an a exactly, an apse, an apse on one end. Uh, and all of those apses face in the same direction. The basilica has an apse, the audience hall has an apse, the triclinium has an apse. Those were Domitian's apses. That's where Domitian sat, Dominus Deus. He wanted to be honored, in fact, worshipped as Lord and God, and he needed a space to do it in. And he wanted to sit on a throne underneath <coughs> the Dome of Heaven, in a sense. And the Dome of Heaven was a vault made out of concrete uh, and decorated in some way in antiquity, probably with mosaic or whatever, to give it the sense of a Dome of Heaven. Uh, he wanted to sit in that space in every one of those rooms. So whether he was trying a law ca ca case, uh, welcoming visiting dignitaries, or s eating in his triclinium, he wanted to sit uh, beneath at least a semi-dome of heaven, and that's indeed what he did as he uh, was again worshipped as Dominus Deus. So this is, this is a very important, I think, uh, phenomenon in this particular monument, and one that is well worth uh, d thinking about uh, in terms of the way in which architecture is used by uh, given individuals <coughs> to <coughs> define themselves, to define their lives, and to define their era. Over here again, the private wing, I'm going to hold on that for a moment, we'll come back to that uh, shortly. This is a, de a detail of the basilica, where we see the plan of the basilica and also a cross-section of the same structure, and you can see it is, it is completely in keeping with other basilican architecture we've looked at, <coughs> in c both in civic uh, locations and elsewhere. Uh, a central nave with an apse on one end, again imagine Domitian sitting over here, uh, the central nave divided from the side aisles by columns, uh, fairly simple uh, but uh, very interesting structure in the context of this particular uh, palace. Over here, an outstanding <coughs> restored view that probably gives you a better sense than almost anything I can show you of the Domus Flavia or the public space of Domitian's palace. Uh, here's, of course, the basilica over here, and you can see that this room, like all of the rooms <coughs> in this palace, uh, were done in marble, and that marble was of various colors, as you can see here, and it was marble that was brought from all over the world. We talked about the fact that the Flavians did this. We talked about this as the case for the Templum Pacus, for example, bringing marble from Egypt and Asia Minor and Greece uh, and uh, elsewhere in the Roman world, bringing it all here and using it, using that variegated marble uh, to make, to, to get to ornament, obviously, this palace in Rome. Over here, the aula, or the, the uh, great audience hall, the aula regia, we call it over here, uh, also with the marble on the floor as well as on the walls. You can see that this particular room, and it was apparent in plan as well, has a scalloping on either around the edge, around the perimeter of the room, uh, a series of niches, as you can see, with uh, with the statuary in them, surrounded by columns, two tiers with uh, other windows up above, as you can see. And here you get a sense of that uh, of that space in which <coughs> Domitian would have sat. The apse of the room, uh, the curvature of the wall, made of course out of concrete, as this entire structure was made out of concrete with a semi-dome, and you have to again imagine a Domitian sitting beneath that or inside that apse and beneath that semi-dome here. The peristyle court open to the sky, uh, columns all around, covered colonnade, two stories, uh, and then in the center this octagonal <coughs> fountain. Leave it to Domitian, leave it to Riberius to transform Nero's uh, octagonal room into a fountain in the context of this <coughs> palace. 
And then on axis again with the Aularegia and with the peristyle is the triclinium. And this restored view again gives you a very good sense of that apse in which Domitian would have sat enthroned with the semidome above his head, uh, two tiers, again the walls uh, decorated with variegated marbles brought from all different parts of the world as well as with columns. And then picture windows through which you would see these very interesting elliptical fountains as you dined, one on either side of the structure. There's a lot of controversy as to how the, b the rooms that were roofed were roofed, whether they had barrel vaults or not. Uh, you can see this particular restored view shows one flat roof and one barrel vaulted uh, roof. We're not absolutely sure about that, and again, scholars continue to argue uh, which was the case here. <coughs> I mentioned statuary in the Aula Regia, and we have some evidence for what that statuary might have been like and the way in which it was used by Domitian. I show you two examples. These are two statues, uh, one representing Hercules on the left and the other on the right representing Apollo. Uh, and, you can, and these are truly colossal in scale. Uh, and uh, they are made of uh, beautiful materials, again, imported materials, in this case a kind of uh, maroon colored stone, in this case a green, greenish colored stone. Again, they're very large in scale, colossal in scale, and you can see the exaggerated musculature of both of these figures. And I think they are very telling in terms of, you know, as we, as we think about Domitian sitting in rooms like <coughs> the Aula Regia, greeting uh, visitors, and w when you think about what this man who wanted to be worshipped as Lord and God thought of himself, and you see the kind of statuary that he surrounded himself <coughs> with. This is a very different man than his predecessor Claudius. Uh, the kind of imagery that he associated himself with is, is a way of pumping himself up, I think, by having himself surrounded uh, by these very athletic figures of Hercules and also of Apollo. Uh, what do you think this is, just from looking at it, the remains? You can see the remains are not as extensive as one wishes they were, but enough is there to allow a reconstruction of the whole. What are we looking at here? The, the uh, octagonal fountain, the octagonal fountain of the peristyle court. Excellent. The, it's really, it, you, it, most, most people who wander around these remains will, will not be able to figure out for the life of themselves what this was. But you'll be glad when you go up on the Palatine Hill to, uh, to know as you stand here that this was once an octagonal fountain with a spectacular water display, undoubtedly. This is the triclinium, or what survives, sad, what survives of Domitian's triclinium. This is his apse. This is the very apse in which uh, Domitian would have sat enthroned uh, as he ate with special invited guests, as he held a state dinner uh, in Rome. Uh, and you can see, if you look very carefully, again, the construction is brick-faced, concrete construction. We talked about the fact that after the fire of 64, a decision was made to uh, begin to, uh, to uh, use brick as a facing because brick was more fireproof than stone. Uh, and we see that borne out the entire uh, imperial palace on the Palatine Hill was made of brick-faced <coughs> concrete construction. But if you look very carefully, uh, you will see some stucco and you will also see some marble revetment. So th in this case, that brick was covered over with marble to give it a much more luxurious look uh, for uh, the Dominus at Deus. Also interesting here, actually, there's a, tar there's a tarp on top of preserved mosaic, and I'll show you that <coughs> mosaic in a moment. But what's interesting here is the, uh, that the pavement rests on something that should remind you of something we saw earlier in the semester, <coughs> which is what? Wendy, you're nodding. So the hypocaust. It's a hypocaust system, just <coughs> as we saw in the Stabian baths in Pompeii. They have raised the pavement up on these uh, piles of brick. Uh, and then in between them would have placed terracotta pipes and also abrasures uh, with hot, hot, hot coals and so on and so forth to heat the floor of the triclinium so that Domitian could not only sit in his apse but could have his feet warm uh, while he ate. This gives you, again, I think a really good <laughs> window into the kind of man we are dealing with here and what he was trying to achieve once again through architecture, through 
architecture. This is another view of the apse in which Domitian sat, and here we do see, with, you know, without the tarp, we can see that the mosaic is actually pretty well preserved, and it is the colors that we so often find in Roman mosaics, especially in major public buildings and in private palaces, uh, this combination of green, maroon, and white, uh, as you see here, with a variety of uh, very <coughs> attractive geometric shapes. Again, you can see the concrete construction faced with brick, and you can see the remains of some of the marble revetment that would have covered the walls and made this all that much more ostentatious in ancient Roman times. This fountain is a marvel. I love this fountain. This is the fountain that you see, or one of the two, that you would see through the panoramic windows of the, pal of the uh, triclinium in Domitian's palace. Uh, and uh, this is where I think the, gen the genius of Rabirius shows through. <laughs> And Rabirius shows, in a sense, himself to be the Frank Gehry of his day. I mean, somebody who really enjoyed undulating, undulating forms and the way in which concavity and convexity can be played off uh, against one another to great result. Uh, it's an elliptical fountain. It's fairly small in scale. It's elliptical, as you can see here. Uh, and the, uh, the um, convexity of that ellipse played off, and you see it repeated again here, played off against these interesting undulating walls. All of this created again out of concrete <coughs> and faced with bricks. So you imagine the bricks have to be very carefully uh, molded to fit where they need to fit into this incredible scheme. And of course, in antiquity, this would have been stuccoed over and probably had some marble revetment on it and so on and so forth. Uh, but the shape is absolutely marvelous, and I think we are definitely in the presence of a great architectural genius in the person of Rabirius, who was working for, uh, for Domitian. The private wing of the palace, equally spectacular in its own way. I mentioned to you already that it's, more, it's larger in, in, uh, in the <coughs> space that it covers than the Domus Flavia, and part of it is on two stories, the part that you see over here. There's a, a fountain court in the center, uh, and then two stories of rooms around that, another peristyle back here, and then a stadium, uh, once again a hairpin shape with a curved side and a flat side, just like his stadium in Rome. But he already had a stadium where he got a public stadium where one could watch racehorses and uh, race, uh, races and the like. He used this instead, and it's, it's actually sunken, because remember, this part is two stories. This is sunken, a sunken stadium next to it. It was used as a place for uh, uh, pleasurable walks, as a kind of outdoor uh, garden uh, where Domitian and, again, special visitors uh, could, uh, could spend some, some time, a uh, pleasant place to walk within the city. Uh, we see here uh, another of uh, an axonometric view from Ward Perkins, where we can also get a very good sense not only of the Domus Flavia, as we've already described it, uh, the basilica and the aula on one end, the octagonal fountain in the center, and then over here, the dining hall with the two, uh, two uh, elliptical fountains, one on either side. Here we see again the private area with the sunken stadium over here with the peristyle court with a fountain in the center, two stories around that, uh, and then over here another uh, couple of other peristyle courts. There are actually three peristyle courts in total here. But what's interesting, I think, when you look at this axonometric view, I think it's interesting to see that, or the uh, kind of cutaway view, uh, that to see that from the outside, uh, a lot of these spaces didn't look as interesting as they did from the inside. We are definitely moving. I mean, we've seen that be the case for a while vis-a-vis -vis Roman architecture. Think back to some of the early residences in Pompeii, where they were very plain and severe on the outside, but when you went in inside uh, and saw the atrium and the impluvium and the compluvium and the, and the garden, it was something else again, this whole element of surprise. And that's true even here, I think, in this palace, where uh, the uh, structures are less interesting from the outside <coughs> and more interesting from the interiors of them. Here's the Google Earth image again of just the private part of the palace, uh, where we see uh, this interesting peristyle court, the other two peristyle courts behind it, uh, these uh, rooms placed on two stories, and then once again, the sunken stadium. Sunken stadium is actually quite well preserved, as you can see here. It's one of the better preserved parts of the villa today. You can get a very good sense not only of its shape and also of its scale. It's enormous, huge stadium. Uh, and again, you have to imagine Domitian wandering around here. 
Uh, and uh, you can see the curved end on one side, but most importantly, the concrete construction faced with brick uh, and including columns and other marble revetment. <coughs> this is a view of that first court, the one that has rooms on two stories around it. Once again, Rabirius has had a great deal of fun with his fountain. He seems to have taken particular pleasure in designing fountains and in letting his mag imagination uh, run free with regard to fountain design. Uh, you, see, you see here, uh, again, he's playing off convex against concave. He's done all of this out of, uh, out of concrete. These shapes are done in concrete faced with brick. And again, the bricks have to be molded very specially to fit uh, the space within that that they need to uh, accommodate themselves to. And if any of you know anything about those female warriors called the Amazons, they carry <coughs> shields called peltas, P-E-L-T-A. As these should remind you, don't they look, Robert, like peltai? Uh, they look very much like, I don't, not, that's probably coincidental. I'm not implying here that there's any, um, any particular iconography <laughs> to this particular fountain, but who knows? But they do look very much like shields that are carried uh, by Amazonian women. But at any rate, this playing off of convex against concave, <coughs> Rabirius is clearly enjoying himself with this monument. Then the rooms on two stories. And you see, just as we saw quite, quite some time ago in the second phase of the Villa of the Mysteries, uh, where they were beginning to open up the exterior and create bay windows and more windows and make it less severe than it had been in the original Domus Italica. We see that sort of thing here. Many more windows <coughs> used, the wall being opened up. They've gotten so sophisticated in their use of concrete uh, that they are able to, um, to open the, the walls up more with these rectangular windows of different shapes. As you can see, some large, some smaller, some on the ground, some higher sort of like windows, and then above, uh, additional um, openings that are, that are arcuated on the top. So clearly, he's again having, enjoying uh, opening up this wall and creating interesting, interesting uh, views from one part of the structure to another. Two more, two more images of that wonderful fountain where I think you can see even better uh, the way in which this has all been done out of concrete, faced with brick. And you have to imagine, of course, the spectacular water display, uh, the, found, the actual water uh, jets that would have come up. Uh, may, the Bellagio it may not have been, but it probably was something, you know, sort of a, probably the ancient version of the Bellagio in Las Vegas, uh, the fountains of the Bellagio. Here you see uh, a restored view of this fountain court. Uh, where you get a sense that once you add a bu bunch of statuary, some water jets, which you don't see actually working here, uh, and paint the walls, uh, the whole thing would have been even more spectacular still. And I think that gives you some general <laughs> sense of the original appearance of the palace. Around the, uh, the, um, the, the court, the fountain court in the private wing that we've just looked at, uh, there were a series of rooms. And if you look at some of those rooms in detail, I think you'll be amazed by what you see. Some fantastically shaped rooms, some of them cruciform, cross-shaped, uh, some of them going way back to the Frigidaria with uh, you know, circular rooms with radiating alcoves. And not surprisingly, again, given uh, what, uh, what uh, Severus and Keller were able to achieve at Nero's Domus Aria, <laughs> uh, given the fact that the octagon uh, is all clearly also in the mind of Riberius in this building, we see him creating small Acta octagonal rooms and exploring and experimenting with those octagonal rooms. And you see a couple of them in plan uh, on the side, <coughs> on one of the sides of this fountain court. I show you here a view from, or several views, from the Ward Perkins textbook where we see a cross section, a plan, and also an axonometric view of one of these octagonal rooms that we believe was designed by Rabirius for the Palatine Palace. And I compare it down here uh, to the octagonal room of Nero's Domus Aurea, which was clearly the model uh, for Rabirius's foray into uh, oct uh, to, to designing octagons. It's a much smaller room than Nero's uh, octagonal room, but he takes the whole concept a step further. It's an octagon, yes, it's eight-sided, just like the Domus Aurea. Uh, it has radiating alcoves. Uh, some of them are rectangular, some of them are, are, are circular, as you can see here. Uh, and if you look at the axonometric view, you will see two interesting things that are a step forward. Uh, one of them is the fact that although in the Domus Aurea, uh, the eight-sided room, although the room was eight-sided, they 
the, the dome was itself essentially uh, a, a you know, cur curved, a, a traditional dome. What we see happening here, though, is they take the eight sides and continue that segmented feel into the dome. So we have an eight-sided segmented dome in the, this octagonal room in the Palatine Palace, which is different than the Domus Aurea. And the other thing, and perhaps even more significant, is the fact that if we look at the individual niches, we will see that they are envelopes of space in the same way that Nero's Domus Aurea was, and that they have, and, and, and just like Nero's Domus Aurea, they have, just like Nero's Domus Aurea, they have niches within <coughs> niches. But what Riberius has done here is something really quite extraordinary and very different from anything we've seen earlier in Roman architecture, and that is he's placed some of these additional niches or windows or doorways off axis with the niche itself. Now, we have seen that the Romans cared above all about axiality and symmetry, and yet we see here, uh, and this is why I call him the Frank Gehry of, of the Roman, uh, you know, of, of Roman architects, he is willing to try something entirely different. He is clearly enamored of, of circles and rectangles and domes and the like, uh, but he is also willing to dispense with the usual axiality of Roman architecture and explore placing things off axis in a quite inventive way. And I can show you that even better by looking quickly at uh, the uh, two views of one of these octagonal rooms from the private wing of the Palatine Palace, uh, where you can see not only, and I hope you can see it from where you are, you can see not only the segments, can you see the segmented dome? I think quite clearly here. Uh, you can see these envelopes of space, you can see these openings, this whole idea of creating vistas from one, uh, one building to another. Uh, but, and you can see that the way in which these vary, that some are doorways, some are windows. But I think you can also see the way in which he is beginning to place, here's a window that is placed completely off axis with the niche. This is even more apparent in this other view, where you can see one of these radiating niches, and in that radiating niche there's an opening that starts at the floor, and then there's another opening to the left of it that's higher up. Uh, and again, you get this sense of asymmetry rather than symmetry in this. And this is, again, very, very experimental, very different. It really is different than almost anything I can show you, not only before, but even after uh, this great work of architecture. And it gives us some insight into the creativity of Riberius and the way in which uh, Domitian was allowing him uh, to be, because I think this goes above and beyond. Clearly, Domitian is imaging himself, I think, especially in the public realm of this building. He's very concerned with how he's presenting himself to his public. Over here, I have the sense that he has really let Riberius be Riberius, that he's let Riberius do what he wanted to do to create an interesting and architecturally exciting space uh, in which he could live uh, and could enjoy uh, some of what, some of the interesting architectural motifs that uh, Riberius instills uh, in this extraordinary structure. Now, D Domitian, <laughs> Domitian was succeeded by John Kerry. No, uh, well, sort of, in the sense that he was succeeded by a man by the name of Nerva, who looks very much like John Kerry, don't you think? I mean, that's a coin of Nerva on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, Domitian, by the way, I think I may have forgotten to mention, but he, he, he ended up just the way Nero did. He was. Um, well, in his case, he was actually assassinated. Nero was forced to commit suicide, but uh, Domitian was assassinated. He was issued a Domnatio Memoriae at his death, uh, and he was succeeded by Nerva, Nerva who was appointed by the Senate. The Senate had had it with despots, uh, and they decided the time had come to choose one of their own, and they selected Nerva, who was an elderly and very highly respected member of the Senate. And this was the first time the Senate did this. In the, for, since Augustus founded the empire in uh, his reign, uh, the first emperor of Rome, uh, this is the first time that an emperor was appointed by the Senate. And Nerva was a highly respected and, and, and pretty level-headed guy, uh, and he was able to bring peace and prosperity uh, back to the empire. He did not last very long, however. He had a very brief reign. Uh, and, uh, and therefore very little time to have an impact on architecture. But again, you see him uh, represented on a coin on the left-hand side of the screen. I'd like to show you one building, though. I'd like to end today with one building that was actually begun by Domitian and then completed by Nerva. 
It began as the so-called Forum Transitorium uh, under Domitian and became the Forum of Nerva under Nerva. In order to do this, I need to take you to the general plan of the imperial fora in Rome. We've looked at this before. You'll remember the location of uh, the Roman Forum here and obviously down below, the Forum of Julius Caesar that we've already studied, the Forum of Augustus built right next to that that we've also looked at in <coughs> detail, and then the Forum Pacus or the Templum Pacus of Vespasian, uh, which we have looked at more recently and which you'll recall was built in such a way so that it faced the Forum of Augustus and the Forum of Julius Caesar next door. I mentioned to you, I think, already that there was a very large piece of property over here uh, that was, that was uh, 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 that on, on which stood essentially <coughs> one of Rome's seven hills, the Quirinal Hill, Q-U-I-R-I-N-A-L, the Quirinal <coughs> Hill of Rome occupied this area. But it was an area that was being eyed by Domitian. You can see from his palace that he had big plans. And uh, once the palace was coming to you know, fruition, he was thinking again about public architecture and the fact that he would really like to build a forum to rival that of his father, a forum that was bigger than that of his father's. And he'd like to put it over here facing his father's forum across the forum of Augustus and the forum of Julius Caesar. He, 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 he dreamed those big dreams, but he was never able to realize them. Uh, what he did instead was to take uh, this area that was located between the Forum of uh, Vespasian and the Forum of Augustus, the Forum of Julius Caesar. This area that I mentioned to you was called the Argilatum, A-R-G-I-L-E-T-U-M, -E -E I think I've got it there, the Argilatum. Uh, th that area was a, a, a street that connected the Roman Forum with an area of Rome called the Subora, S-U-B-U-R-A, the Subora, which was a residential area that I mentioned was, uh, was, uh, had in it mostly these wooden apartment houses, large numbers of people lived in the Subora. So there was the street, the Argilatum, that, uh, that uh, attached the two or that connected the two to one another. And Domitian decided to use that as a forum to himself uh, that would be placed next to that of his father. Uh, and he placed in that forum a temple of his patron goddess Minerva. His patron goddess was Minerva. And he, 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 he built a temple uh, to honor her uh, in this location. Because this forum was, so, was like a street and was so narrow, uh, that, had a, that had an effect on what could be built there. So that you can see, for example, in plan that while the forums of Julius Caesar and Augustus and the Forum Pacus all had colonnades, covered colonnades, in fact. There was no space to build a covered colonnade here. So what they had to do was place the columns very close to the wall uh, and not put any ceiling on top of those columns. Uh, you can see the same here. This is a plan of the, uh, of the original Forum of Domitian, or what was called the Forum <coughs> Transitorium, because it served as a point of transit between the Sabora and the Roman Forum. The Temple of Minerva over here, consistent with temple architecture as we've seen it thus far this semester, uh, a temple with a frontal orientation, single staircase, uh, facade orientation, freestanding columns in the porch, and so on. Uh, the entranceway over here, the Forum Pacus would be here, the Forum of Caesar and Augustus at the top. Uh, and then you can see these bases for the columns very close to the wall, not attached to it, but very close <coughs> uh, to the wall on either side because there's no space for colonnades. Here's a Google Earth image uh, showing the imperial fora as it looks today, part of the later Forum of Trajan, the Forum of Augustus, and what is preserved of the so-called Forum Transitorium over here. This is a model of what the Forum Transitorium would have looked like in ancient Roman times, in the time of Domitian, with the Temple of Minerva, uh, with these columns on either side. And you can see from this model the difference that that makes when you don't have enough space to build covered colonnades. You've got columns that look like they are projecting out of the wall with projecting entablatures on top of them. We have not seen this before in built architecture. This is a very important development. We have seen it in painting, but we haven't seen it in built architecture. Here's a <laughs> detail of the Forum Transitorium with these columns uh, placed almost flush with the wall, although not quite. They project a little bit in front of the wall with the projecting entablatures. Uh, the building, the walls made out of tufa blocks, as you can see here, 
uh, the rest with marble and a panel at the top, and we think there would have been lots of such panels representing the goddess Minerva him herself. So we, ha we see that here. We have not seen it in built architecture before, but we have seen it in painting. This is a detail of Cubiculum 16 in the Villa of the Mysteries. Uh, and you can see one such set of columns that project out of the wall with the projecting entablatures up <coughs> above. Uh, so it's something, again, that we think may have been uh, done in uh, temporary wooden architecture, for example. Uh, but keep in mind how early that painting is. You all know the date of it because you've studied it for the exam. <laughs> it's mid-BC. Uh, so it's way b b before even the Augustan period. Uh, and yet we see that there. And now we finally see it in built architecture. And it's going to have a real history in Roman architecture in a very different way than concrete does. This whole idea of decorating a wall by placing a series of columns that project in and out along that wall, giving it a kind of using the traditional language of, of architecture, columns, to create a kind of undulating wall, or what we're going to call later in the semester a Baroque uh, wall. Two details of the, uh, some of the one of the surviving capitals with the frieze up above, uh, a frieze that represents scenes of women weaving. I'm not going to get into the meaning of all of that here today. Uh, but you can see the way in which the columns project somewhat out of the wall, Corinthian capitals, projecting entablature, very highly decorated, just like all of Flavian architectural ornament. Uh, as you can see here, very deeply drilled, and so on and so forth. But this whole idea of decorating a wall in this way and instilling movement in that wall by this undulating in and out uh, scheme uh, is going to, again, have a very important future in Roman architecture. This is an interesting view because it shows us just what we've looked at, some of those <coughs> remaining columns from the so-called Forum Transitorium, which was renamed the Forum of Nero after Domitian's death and Domnatio Memoriae. Nero just took it over and said, OK, it's my forum now, and renamed it uh, to himself, but didn't add anything architecturally to it. Uh, we see it here. And this is one of those great views in which you can see the difference between modern ground level and ancient ground level. In order to see the lower part of the forum, you've got to go right up to the edge of the street and look down on it. And this also a interesting engraving by the famous uh, artist Piranesi, Piranesi print of the 18th century. I did a lot of uh, wonderful prints. And if, if there's any interest in this class, by the way, we have plenty of these at Yale. And I know one of the teaching fellows, if not more than one, would be more than happy to, to, uh, to, to uh, find the time to take those of you who might be interested in looking at Piranesi prints of Rome. Uh, over to the British Art Center and so on to or elsewhere to take a look at these. But what's interesting about this one is it shows uh, where the ground level was at the time that this was uh, engraved by uh, Piranesi, that is in the 18th century. It was pretty much where it is here. Uh, it was much, uh, much higher than it is now. And then when they excavated it in modern <coughs> times, they got us down uh, to ancient ground level and to the bottoms of the columns. I want to end up with this one last image uh, because we are very different, <laughs> Wendy, uh, very different. But uh, it, 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 it allows us to continue on with a, with a point that I made when we discussed the Colosseum, which is already turned up uh, in the online forum. And that is the use of, of, of Roman buildings uh, as quarries uh, for later architects and later patrons, namely princes and popes. Uh, and the way in which uh, buildings like the Colosseum were pirated uh, for later architecture. In the case of the Forum Transitorium, or the Forum of Minerva, we know that the Temple of Minerva, that the material out of which it's made, the reason that it does not exist at all today, the Temple of Minerva, is that it was taken apart and re reused uh, by um, Pope Paul V for a fountain that he wanted to build on the Janiculum Hill in Rome the so-called Aqua Paula, which you see here. Uh, and uh, the Aqua Paula, the, uh, the temple was torn down in 1606. It still stood in 1606. It was torn down then. And it was placed uh, in this fountain, or used for the construction of this fountain that was dedicated in 1612 and uh, built by the architect Giovanni Fontana. Uh, and you see it here. Uh, and it's not easy to determine exactly which, is, you know, which parts are from the temple itself, but much of the building stone that you see here reused in this fountain comes from the temple of Minerva in Rome. So it shows you 
uh, the way, again, the way in which these buildings were used as quarries, but the way in which Roman buildings live on. They either live on as themselves or they live on as other buildings, and I think that's a nice, a nice thought and a nice note on which to end today. Thank you.